can't beat him, can you? He's the best friend, the best partner. He'll never let you down. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. Hallelujah. You know, as a man today, I, I just, uh, God is so good. I know, Ted, how many times I've invited him to church. And uh, it was over there, I believe it was the second group. He come walking in with a good talk. <laughs> and I'm telling you, he played, he played good, didn't he? he played Amazing Grace. And, and I don't know. I'll, yeah, I'll tell you, but God, God, God works. He's awesome. He's awesome. And, and, and it was opening the door to go out, and a man run up to me and he said, I got to be baptized. I said, it's, it's no, light, no day like today. Go get your wife, and we'll carry you to the creek. So he, he took his groceries home, brought his wife back. We took him to the creek, baptized him. And, and uh, Brother Will, he got to lead a woman to the Lord. I, I'm telling you, it's been an exciting day. Every day can be that way if you if you ask the Lord to lead and guide you. I mean, he's so awesome. It's all about love. Say that with me. It's all about love. If you don't have love, you're... You'll never be able to do it. And we have to have God love. And when we got God love, nothing will upset us. Nothing will. There's a couple God, God, how many of you know God never gets upset? He don't, he don't even know what the word is. Upset. He didn't invent that word. Satan invented it. He never gets upset. And so he don't want us to get upset. He wants us to be calm and, 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 and just trust in him. Good to see everybody tonight. If you can see it. We're going to get right into the Word of the Lord, and if I can get these lights dimmed on me just a little. All right. Look at our crew cross. Isn't that awesome? He, Brother Ed uh, is getting it uh, really, he, this one's fixed, and then we're putting three up there when he finally gets it done, and uh, it's going to be an awesome display of the crosses. Amen. So we're just, um, we want to thank him for doing that. The other one's going to go over to the youth church. Is that where it is? Is that right over there? All right. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, there's a lot more about the Brother Ed's one. Did the cross and all of the help. You know, anything that you do to contribute toward this church is, is greatly appreciated. You know, whatever it is. And if you have, like Brother Ed, he said, I want to do that. And I said, well, have at it. We'll get you the material. Did an awesome job. Any, You know, anything that we can do to... Um, it's, it's an honor to the Lord. It, it's, it's a blessing, and we, we appreciate it. Amen. All right, let's, let's look to the Word of the Lord. But before we do, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow at 2 o'clock is the service for Sister Melinda, her home going. And um, it will be at Brother Rob's and Sister Sue Stidham's church. They're going 52, close to Westmoreland. Uh, and the service will begin at 2 o'clock. The visitation begins at 11 in the morning, and it will end when the service time begins. And so, uh, and Miss Nancy just wants to thank everybody for the all the food, all the prayers, all the support, and the care, and, and everything. We'll be talking about that a little bit more. But what we're going to do as a church family for them a little bit later on. But uh, uh, it's uh, it's awesome what the Lord has helped all of our church to do, and they appreciate it so much. Uh, before we uh, go to the to the word of the Lord, I want to, there's a couple of prayer requests. I don't know if y'all noticed it Sunday morning, but Brother David Skinner, I could tell, I've known him long enough to know that something wasn't exactly 100%. He, he never complained, he wouldn't have said a word about it, but after church he asked to have prayer. He got too hot, he had a heat stroke. Just, this was like in the week before he come down here and was wound up um, having to go to the emergency room and everything. And he hadn't totally recovered, but I got a call back from him, and his blood work all turned out real good. He's 100%. He just has to recover from the heat. Um, and also, my brother Bill Elliott is in St. Thomas as we speak. Uh, he passed out on the job. He went over. He was building the deck and reached over to get a two before and just fell on his face and, and um, just passed out. The boy that was with him, we've known him ever since he was kids, both of them together. Called 911, of course, they got him to the ambulance, got him to St. Thomas. They thought he had a heart attack. 
was not a heart attack, but he does have to have a bowel replacement. Surgery is scheduled for Friday morning, so if you'll just remember those two prayer requests. My uh, ex-mother-in-law, she's in the hospital, she had a stroke in the middle of the night. Okay. And then divorced my daughter, she's in the hospital okay. over there in okay. uh, Andersonville. Okay. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's just look to Him right now for all that. Father, we believe if we come to You, Lord, we're coming individually, but we're coming as a corporate body. And we're bringing these needs that's been mentioned. Each name, Lord, each, each one that, you know, the situation, uh, the families uh, that are suffering the loss of, of this Father, the, the different ones that are in the hospitals and all the situations that's going on in everything, Lord. But we know we can look to You because you're faithful. We just ask that your healing hand will be stretched out, your saving hand will be stretched out, the delivering hand will be stretched out. Lord, I thank you for taking care of the situations in every one of them. We just give you praise in Jesus' name. Just remember these, these as you pray, just lift them up before the Lord, okay? Hallelujah. All right, let's look to the word of the Lord tonight. Uh, we're going to go to the book of John. We're going to continue with our study that we talked about uh, last uh, week about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. We read you all the scriptures that um, uh, pertain to being filled. Or, but John chapter 20, verse 19 and 20, this is when Jesus was getting ready to leave them and go back to heaven. And he just, the Bible says, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive it. Receive it. This is, uh, not, uh, this is chapter 20, excuse me. Chapter 20, 19, and 22. But 22 says, When he had breathed on them, he said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And I believe that he's still doing that for the church. He is still breathing life and breathing life into us and saying, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. You see, before we can see the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, we first must be filled. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is God working with us, confirming the word with signs following. It's the Holy Spirit that's at work. Uh, God, Jesus is not down here personally anymore. He's gone back to heaven. We're going to find out. He said, I have to go away. For if I don't go away, the Comforter cannot come back. But if the church would receive the Holy Ghost, just receive it. It's a gift from God. And if we would just receive this gift, then God could work through us, work in us, and work through us to do the work of the ministry. So just keep that in mind as you pray in your daily prayers and as you study the word of the Lord. Just say, Lord, I receive. I receive from you. I just receive from you. God's not going to give you anything bad. <laughs> He's going to just give you something good. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Lord. So just, just say, Lord, you know, I receive it. Uh, even if you are filled, you need to be refilled and refilled and refilled and, and just keep it, the stirring up your most holy faith, James says, praying in the Holy Ghost. Um, so the, the Lord works with us, confirming the word. Did you know that every battle has already been won by the Spirit? Yeah. The Spirit of God. He will fight our battles. We can see that in Romans later on as we study this. Every disease has been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Every sin has been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And every oppression has been delivered by the power of God. So we have everything that we need. How Jesus of Nazareth 
how he was anointed with power of the Holy Ghost, went about doing good, healing all that was oppressed of the devil. The Holy Spirit is doing that work today in us. If we just receive. It's just a matter of receiving. It's not even really a matter of seeking as much as it is just receiving. All right. Um, I just had a couple of things I just want to kind of go back and um, mention that we, we talked about. And some things that's just been going on. The Lord's just been so rich in the service um, today. In order for the manifestation of the different gifts to operate, as we find in 1 Corinthians 11, 12, 13, and 14, we have to have it in us for it to operate through us. So that, that's the reason why we need it. Uh, the church uh, can't operate without it effectively until we allow the Holy Spirit to come within us and do the work of the Lord. Um, Brother David said something uh, Sunday morning that, that I wrote down. You know, I was talking about Elijah uh, leaving and Elisha requesting a double portion. Um, and he says as firstborn sons, and that's who we are in the Lord. Do you know that every one of you is a firstborn son? You know, under the, under the old covenant, firstborn sons got a double portion. And if we could ever get that truth in us, that we're firstborn sons. You know, no matter how, where we came to know the Lord, we're firstborn sons. The Bible says, Beloved, now, now, right now, are we the sons of God. We're not the seventh son or the eighth son or the millionth son. We're all firstborn sons, and we have the right to a double portion of his spirit. Amen? All right, so just, just remember that. I just wanted to bring that uh, um, out to you and just different things I'm, I'm seeing here that I'm just written down. Um, all right, let's turn to, uh, to John chapter 16. Maybe I'll find some more of these things I wanted to mention to you, but I write down all kinds of notes. And... All right. John chapter 16. We're going to uh, continue talking about the Holy Spirit. We're going to just do, do it in little segments now because I gave you all these scriptures last Wednesday night and went through them, just read the scripture after scripture. Uh, John chapter 16. Let's begin with uh, verse 7. All right. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. All right. Who is the Comforter? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about. Just, that's a word that you will see throughout of the, the New Testament about the Comforter or the Holy Spirit. All right, now look what it says. And when he is come, the Holy Spirit, he will reprove the world of sin. Reprove the world of sin. He is the one who convicts the heart of every person, whether saved or unsaved. He is the one that lets you know that you're doing right or you're doing wrong. And wrong is when you're convicted. All right, he operates in three areas. One, he operates in this one we're talking about. He, is, he will reprove the world. He will rebuke the world. He will convict the world or he convince the world. Is really a translation. Convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment in three areas. Uh, and he said, of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Let's, let's break that down just a little bit and talk about it. Uh, the principal work of proclaiming, declaring the gospel is getting people under conviction, the sinner under conviction. If the sinner never gets under conviction, he will never know his need for God. Do you know that we, with the Holy Spirit living in us, if we do the right thing and we're living according to the word of the Lord and we're walking in righteousness, do you know that the Holy Spirit uses us to convict people? Have you ever been around somebody and they, 
and you just walked in and they knew you loved the Lord and you were a Christian, you were living for God, and they said things they shouldn't say, opened their mouth and said stuff, and they said, oh, excuse me, you know, and apologize. You just convicted that person. The Holy Spirit just used your presence there, bodily presence. Not only did um, that you do it, because the Holy Spirit let them know they did wrong, but you, you were an instrument of God right then. You were a witness. You were an instrument that convicted people of sin. Now, if, if people don't do that around us, if they don't, if they're not convicted around us, maybe we need to check up on our own lives. You see what I'm saying? Because we've got to be instruments of the Lord, right? We've got to be witnesses. Now, witnesses is not going up and asking somebody if they're saved or not all the time. Being a witness, that's part of it. But being a witness is living such a godly life that people actually feel the presence of the Lord and they get convicted in your presence. If preaching doesn't convict the sinner, then your preaching is in vain. Because the Holy Spirit cannot save them or lead them to, to know the saving knowledge of the Lord unless they get convicted. Because if, if I'm not doing wrong and I don't feel like I'm doing wrong, I'm not going to I'm not gonna change. Anybody agree with me? I've got to be convicted. And I believe that's where the church has got away from is praying for a Holy Spirit conviction. And that's what we need to do over in our food ministry. We need to pray that the presence of the Lord will be so strong that people who are not saved will actually come to us and say, I want to get saved. Just like this man led up the pastor and said, I've got to get baptized today. When they sense and know that the Lord is there, they'll do something. Now, that's what happened at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost was poured out. They didn't go to door to door and knock on people's doors and says, you know, you need to come over here and hear what's going on at, at Jerusalem. No, they didn't. There was so much noise going on that they all ran together. There was noise. There were signs. There was something happening. They could sense a presence of something that had not been there before. And I believe if, if we can understand that, and realize that we are an instrument of righteousness. That, and we are a vessel that the Holy Ghost lives in. And we need to allow the Holy Ghost to use us everywhere we are. We don't always have to be, you know, shouting and rejoicing and praying in tongues. And all. We just need to let the Holy Ghost be God, you know. And people will get convicted because the Lord, I mean, the Holy Ghost uses us. Or the Lord does either, both are terms. All right. Okay. Uh, the term convict means to expose or convince. People need to be convinced of their sins or convicted of their sins. All right? Three areas of the, the convicting uh, spirit operates. is One is sin. The Holy Spirit will expose sin and unbelief in order to awaken a consciousness of guilt and need for forgiveness. If, if I don't feel like I need the Lord, how many knows I'm not going to do anything about it? That's why it, it seems like that people have to come almost to the what, to the just to the rock bottom before they ever need the Lord because they're so feel so self sufficient. But if I'm convicted and I have my conscience is awakened to the fact that I'm a sinner, and, and I believe the church has got away from praying for that convicted. You know, when revivals, that's what we pray for, and, and we forget about it sometimes. I know I do. I don't always pray God send conviction on people. You know, make them miserable. There's nothing can stare you like being miserable, right? Make them miserable. I mean, just, you know, take their sleep away from them. Uh, you know, take their appetite away from them. You say, well, is that wrong? No. I'd rather do that than see them go to hell. I mean, we need to pray for conviction where people will get so stared up that you know, if they have to get so shook up that they'll run to the church and ask, ask you know, come to the altar. Uh, there's, there's been services I've been in that people just come in and run to the altar. Uh, I remember one time years and years ago, I got a call, and, and this young man, he was only 18 or 19 years old. He called me, he said, I have got to get saved tonight. Well, there was nobody else to go there because he was just a young boy, and I knew him, just a teenager, and I said, well, I'll meet you at the church. I mean, that boy fell on that altar, and I mean, he prayed and called out to God. And when he got up, he said, I'm, I'm saved. I know it. And, of course, you know, we went on from there. But 
That's what we need. We, we need that Holy Ghost conviction because he said when he comes, he will reprove, convince, or, and, co and convict the, the world of sin. And let's get back to praying that. Okay, church? Let's get back to praying that God will send such conviction in Macon County that people are going to get so stirred up that they have to come to know the Lord. All right. That's what he's here for. That's what the Holy Spirit's purpose is. It, to awaken a consciousness of guilt and need for forgiveness. Uh, you know, we love to preach there's now no condemnation in Christ. But, but we need to read the scripture. There is therefore now no, condi no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, there's no condemnation when we follow the Spirit of God because we know we're right. But folks, when I get in the flesh, I feel condemned. I feel convicted. I feel reproved and rebuked of the Lord. And that's what we need. Bless God. We need that. If you step over in the flesh, remember, I step over into it, we need the convicted presence of the Holy Ghost to let us know, hey, you just missed it. And you need to get it right. And we need to pray that in our own lives and in the lives of the people around us. All right. Uh, conviction also makes clear the fearful results if the guilty persist in wrongdoing. After conviction, a choice then must be made. You know, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, then you've got a choice. You can ignore it or you can obey it. And as, you, as soon as you obey it and you repent of it, it's under the blood. As far as God is concerned, you didn't even do that. Isn't that awesome? Huh? But, if you don't ask God to forgive you, it will be held accountable to you until you do. It'll be held accountable. You will face it at the judgment. You say, well, I, didn't, I just told a little bitty white lie. Well, lies a lie. You know what you did? You planted a seed right then to become a liar. If you don't walk it in truth, you plant a seed, and then the next time it'll grow. And when it grows and it grows, then if you're not careful, you will get a spirit of lying. And that's sad. And then next thing you know, God won't believe a word you say. Now, it doesn't matter whether... I believe a word you say. It's whether or not God will believe a word you say. And I believe that's why some people are not getting any results from God is that they've made promises to God they've never kept. How, how many of you that somebody keeps promising, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this, and they never do it? How long is it going to take you to believe they're not going to keep their word? Huh? How, how about God? Is he not the same way? I mean, you can keep making promises and making promises, and after a while, the Lord says, you know what, I don't even need to listen to you. You're not going to follow through anyway. So we don't want to be in that position. Okay. So after conviction, a choice must be made. This will often lead to true repentance and turning to Jesus as Lord and Savior. If, you know, we understand, you know, about the convicting spirit, so he's going to convict us of sin. And he said he will convict the world of righteousness. The Spirit convinces people that Jesus is the righteous Son of God, resurrected, vindicated, and now the Lord of all. He makes them aware of God's standard of righteousness in Christ, shows them what sin is, and gives them power to overcome the world. We are written epistles, the Bible says, known and read by all men. So if they don't hear the Word of God preached... But if we are, are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, which we are, we must walk it out on a daily basis. We must walk it out. Everybody that you deal with must know that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That will convince the world what righteousness is. If they never see it, if they never hear it, if they never know it, how can they be convinced of the righteousness of God? How many sinners study the Word of God?
How many unbelievers try to be righteous? They only have one Bible that they read, and that's me and you. So if we're walking the steps of righteousness, if we're doing what the Bible says, and righteous, the righteousness of God that God puts in us, it's just God's way of doing the right thing. I mean, that's it. Whatever we think, whatever we do, whatever we believe, however we are, we must do it according to the word of the Lord. Then so the Holy Spirit em empowers us to do that. Okay. It convinces the world through us because we're a witness, right? You know, when Jesus said you'll be witnesses, he just didn't mean a verbal speaking. He meant a lifestyle. He meant whatever you do, it's got to be done. You know, it, it's hard to uh, convince somebody to live for God if you've just, they've just seen you sometime in your past pretending or, or confessing to be a Christian and then you did something that was so unchrist like And then you meet them a little bit later on and you may have forgotten about how ugly you were. And then you try to convince them to come to church and they look at you and say, what? You know. So, and you never know when that person is going to cross your path again. You never know when that person is going to, uh, you know, you're going to have an opportunity to witness them about the Lord. And if you've already witnessed the other way, it's going to be hard to convince them of righteousness. Amen. All right. So, the Spirit convinces people that Jesus is the righteous Son of God, but we also are the one he uses to convince them that, that. okay? Of judgment. All right, he's going to uh, operate through the convincing power of his spirit for judgment. The spirit convinces people of Satan's defeat at the cross. How, how can he convince people that, that, he was that Satan was defeated at the cross? If we don't walk knowing that he's defeated, how can the world ever know it? How can the world know it? You know, Paul said that God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching, the foolishness of preaching, to save them that believe. Did you know that everybody sitting in this place tonight is a preacher of righteousness, of judgment, and against sin? We all are. You say, well, I don't get in the pulpit. I don't feel called. You're called to be a Christian. <clears throat> You're called with a holy calling. I'm called with a holy calling. And everybody that I meet and everybody that I come in contact with, I have an opportunity to prove that the Bible is true by the life that I live. A lot of people can't hear a word that we say because they know our lifestyle. All right. So, uh, Satan is, the Spirit convinces people of Satan's defeat at the cross. Let me ask you this. Has the Holy Spirit convinced you that Satan was defeated at the cross? You know, we don't know it. How's the world going to know it? So, we've got to live knowing that Satan was defeated at the cross. Okay. All right. Um, God's present judgment of the world. And the future judgment of the entire human race. God is still a God of judgment. God is still the God that says this is right and this is wrong. Now judgment is not always punishment. Judgment is not always punishment. Judgment is determine what's right and what's wrong. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit operating in us... Sometimes we don't know what's right and what's wrong. So we need to have the Holy Spirit working in us to determine right from wrong. All right. Okay. The Spirit's work of convicting people of sin, righteousness, and judgment will be manifested in all of us who are baptized in the Holy Spirit and are truly Spirit-filled believers. Christ filled, uh, Christ filled with the Spirit testified to the world that what it does is evil and call people to repent. John the Baptist came on the scene saying repent. Jesus came on the scene repent. Peter, being filled with the Holy Ghost, stood up and said, 
We're not drunk as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters, and he goes on to tell it. And when they heard the message, they said, what men and brethren, what shall we do? And then he told them to repent, repent. And he, re, the repentance, the message of repentance and the power of the Holy Spirit that was at work convicted the hearts of 3,000 people on that day and called them to repent and receive forgiveness. So as a church, if we don't do that, then we're not really fulfilling the calling of the New Testament church. Let's read on. All right, of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Notice what he will do. When the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. So it's not just directed toward getting the, the sinner saved, but he's... He's coming to us to do what? To guide us into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Notice those things that he's going to do for us as, as believers. Uh, he's going to guide us into all truth. There's a lot of uh, doctrine going on in the world. And, and he, we need to know the truth. The best way you can know the truth is allow the Holy Spirit to teach you from the Word of God. Because you cannot receive it unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. But if you allow the Holy Ghost to reveal it to you, then you will receive truth. There's a, there's a lot of things that sound almost like the truth. It sounds so good, it's almost convincing that it's truth. But keep listening. Because somewhere along the way, you will, your, your spirit is not witnessing that it's truth. The Holy Spirit in you will witness to the truth that's been, been said. And then you will know. All right. So he will guide us into all truth. He will guide us and direct us. Um, he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit will reveal to us things that are about to take place. If we will pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will reveal them to us um, he shall glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. When, when the Lord gets ready to reveal things to us, I, I believe that, that we could know more about the Lord. We could know more about him, his plans, and his purposes for our lives. And even for our families, a lot of things God can convince and let us know if we will just pray in the Spirit until God lets us know what to do. You say, well, I'd be praying in the Spirit all the time. Bless God, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. Just pray in the Spirit until the Lord, He it may not come right then. You may not even know why the Lord keeps leading you or you keep feeling to pray in the Spirit. You don't have to know. The Bible says that our understanding is unfruitful, but our spirit is praying and that will be walked out or manifested later on. You don't have to have the revelation right then. Because you may be praying for some future thing that's about to take place. And the Holy Spirit don't have to give you everything. How many knows that sometimes God don't give you the end from the beginning? Yeah. Sometimes you have to walk it out one step at a time. But He will guide and He will direct and He will lead. And He will cause us to know these things. I just want to encourage you. I see y'all are tired tonight. I see, uh, you know, tiredness on everybody, and that's okay. So I'm going to stop right here. I'm